Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's MitoAction monthly expert series. My name is Kyra Mann, CEO of MitoAction, and we are so glad that you took the time out of your day to be here with us. Today's presentation will be recorded and available on the MitoAction website in the coming days, as well as on our podcasts and Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify channels. If you are joining us via phone, I would encourage you to follow along with the presentation slides that can be found on our website at www.mitoaction.org slash resources slash protocols. If you're joining us via your computer, you should see the presentation on your screen. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature on the bottom menu bar. If you're calling in via phone, feel free to submit your questions to us by email at info at mitoaction.org. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible at the end of today's presentation. So everyone in the Mito community understands the stress of having to take your loved one to the ER. With the complexities of mitochondrial disease, you're filled with anxiety as you wonder, will the doctors I encountered even know what Mito is? Will they know what to do? Will they know what medications might put my loved one at risk? Will they hear me when I try to share our experiences with previous medical interventions and as I advocate for my loved one? To help us navigate with tools and suggestions to make these ER and doctor visits less stressful, we are excited to have with us today, Dr. Mark Corson. Dr. Corson is board certified as a clinical biochemical geneticist and has extensive experience in the diagnosis and management of children and adults with a wide array of inborn, inborn errors of metabolism, specifically mitochondrial and metabolic disorders. Dr. Corson promotes an educational approach to addressing the growing crisis in metabolic health care due to the shortage of available clinics to treat the patient community. In 2007, Dr. Corson co-founded the North American Metabolic Academy, an annual one-week intensive course about metabolic disease for genetic and metabolic trainees. NAMA is sponsored by the Society for Inherited Metabolic Disorders. Between 2007 and 2011, Dr. Corson directed the Metabolic Outreach Service based at Tufts Medical Center, for which he traveled on a regular basis to five teaching hospitals in the Northeastern US without an on-site metabolic service. In 2015, Dr. Corson co-founded the Genetic Metabolic Center for Education, a comprehensive multimodal initiative for improving the level of care for children and adults with metabolic disease. Dr. Corson joined VMP Genetics in Atlanta to promote telehealth metabolic consulting in order to assist physicians remotely in the care of their metabolic patients. He continues to develop innovative resources to help educate medical specialists and their trainees so they can participate more in the diagnosis and management of metabolic disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Corson. Good afternoon. Um, it's always a pleasure um, to participate in these sessions. And, <clears throat> but to be honest, I would much rather be participating in person. Um, gosh, <laughs> I, I miss socializing with people um, at conferences. Um, Zoom is okay, but it's just okay. Um, so thank you for joining um, today. What I'm going to do is um, talk a little bit about, um, about how to make <clears throat> your journey to the ER or uh, your journey to the ER, or your child's journey, um, or the journey to, to surgery um, procedure. It's all kind of the same thing because um, when you have a rare disease, and you are facing uh, people who are unfamiliar with that rare disease, it could be mito, it could be something else, um, you're very vulnerable. And so we're gonna talk about protocols today, and we're gonna talk about what makes a good protocol so that when you speak to your doctor <clears throat> uh, about your needs for a protocol, and they'll often give you one because they know what you're up against, 
um, you can scan it and um, get a sense of if it will fly well or if it won't fly well. And because your um, interaction with your doctor uh, should be a collaborative one to make sure that your your child's course is a success. Um, you should be aware of, of, of what makes a good protocol. And in the process, we're going to um, do a little learning about uh, mitochondrial disease. So, hey, it's, it's all good. All right. So have you encountered a situation in which an ED doc has not listened to you and what you know about mitochondrial disease? And I could take out mitochondrial disease and put in fatty acid oxidation defects, organic acidemias, urea cycle disorders, anything. There are rare disease. Um, when rare disease hits the ER, it's, um, it's an unpredictable experience. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I think the first thing um, to remember and recognize is that some physicians are intimidated when patients or parents know more about the condition than they do. Um, you have to remember that doctors are human and um, have all the strengths and the weaknesses of being human. So uh, intimidation happens and, and unfortunately it makes the ER experience uh, problematic. But some basic guidelines. If you are in the ER, even with your protocol, if you're in the ER and things are not proceeding uh, as you think they should, not getting attention, uh, mistakes being made, then um, be in the face of the ED doc and have them call your mitochondrial or your metabolic doc. If he or she won't do that, then you call your metabolic or mitochondrial doc and have them call um, the emergency room physician. Um, because sometimes the ED doc won't, won't follow your um, instructions. And um, if I am called because um, my patient is worried and I call the ED, then I can start, I can, I can figure out what the issues are, if there's a misunderstanding, um, lack of knowledge, um, where the problem is. And I can also prioritize the problems for the ER physician and throw around scary terms like coma or acidosis or something like that to move things along. Um, the other thing that one could do, especially if you're going to an ER um, where you've had problems before um, or there's a particular concern, is especially if you've already spoken to your metabolic or mitochondrial um, doc, um, have them run interference for you. Have them call the ED before you get there to alert um, the doctor. Usually they, they'll end up speaking to the um, uh, triage nurse, but to alert them what the concerns are um, <clears throat> and, and what needs to be done. And often that smooths the way for you. So <clears throat> what's really important though, is to have a good protocol with you. And the thing is just having a piece of paper isn't good enough. Not every protocol letter is a practical or an effective one because sometimes it has just too little information. So there's information about mitochondrial disease, but that's it. And then the ER doc has to sort of figure out what applies here and what does not. Sometimes there is so much information about um, mitochondrial disease or about the patient with every problem, um, 15 or 20 problems, that the um, letter is completely overwhelming. And um, you know, if you know anything about ER docs, they move quickly. And so having a five page protocol within detail, with all the details of everything is um, just the presence of it. Uh, you may need to have that. Maybe you put it as a reference or as an appendix, but um, presentation is just as important as the information itself. Um, and you know that actually um, use, um, um, if you're cooking something and you prepare uh, a terrific dish and it it's delicious and it looks 
it doesn't look appealing, the presentation isn't good, uh, you're not going to get people to eat it, even though the, it, it, it's amazing. Same thing with the protocol. The protocol may be absolutely terrific, but how you present the information is also very important. Um, sometimes the protocol uh, letter is too specific. It is so specific that if these particular situations happen um, uh, to my patient, then, but sometimes it's so specific that unless the patient is uh, behaving in exactly that way, the letter might get um, uh, discarded or put aside. And then sometimes it's not specific enough and it doesn't give enough information to direct the, pay, uh, the physician uh, 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 to know what to do. And then the technical issues. Um, the, the letter hasn't been kept updated. So you're uh, coming into the ER with a letter that's dated 19, um, 2019 and the ER won't uh, listen to it, even uh, won't read it, even though um, you have a, uh, it's a letterhead, even though it's signed it becomes problematic. So you wanna make sure that uh, technically it, it fulfills the criteria of, a, of a, uh, an active protocol. So what happens if you really use a bad protocol? Again, it can get ignored. It can introduce rather than uh, um, educate, it introduces confusion. It makes the doc nervous about what to do. It doesn't reassure, it doesn't help them, it makes them nervous. And if um, it gets really bad, the, 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 the doc will withdraw or lose confidence that, and, and, and say, I can't handle this. Um, and I've seen this happen again and again and again, where a patient, admittedly a complex patient, goes to the ER with a relatively common problem. Could be pneumonia, could be a sore throat, and, they, and, the, and the doctor freezes because, oh my God, this patient has so many problems. I can't, I don't know what the antibiotics, I don't know, I, um, I'm afraid if the patient may get pneumonia away and they just completely back away. And, 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 they, and the simple problem doesn't get addressed. So, um, so then it's obstructive to care. The, the protocol actually obstructs uh, basic care. So what are the attributes of a good protocol? <clears throat> it should assume that the doctor is not familiar with the disease, which is absolutely true. And you don't tell everything there is to know about the disease. You care only um, um, to, you keep it focused. Um, it describes, it should describe the patient's particular or unique issues. Because as you know, every person's mitochondrial disease, even if you have the same subtype of mitochondrial disease is different. And so, um, you have to alert, describe what the patient's overall phenotype um, is. Um, the issues have to be explained clearly using understandable language. And um, it's not that the doctors don't understand uh, doctor talk, but every um, specialty has its own lingo. It often has its own acronyms. And, and if you're not, if you don't belong, if you, if you don't practice in that um, uh, medical community, that particular medical community, you, it, things might uh, be missed. Um, it breaks down the issue into parts. So if you're if you're if it's a surgery if it's a surgery protocol, you talk about the pre um, um, like um, pre surgery. So anesthesia. You talk about during surgery. You talk about post surgery. So it breaks it down and makes it logical rather than having um, a bits of uh, sentences about all the aspects of. Um, um, the issue that is the concern uh, for the protocol. Um, the protocol should offer practical common sense advice. Um, it, it shouldn't be, a little bit of theory is okay, but it should be extremely practical. Um, you know, busy physicians in a surgical setting, an ED setting, don't, don't wanna be learning like all about theory. It has to have a practical basis to it. Um, the, the, the information should be open-ended or the recommendations rather should be open-ended um, and not, uh, but not vague. It shouldn't be so vague that you finish reading and you don't know what to do. Um, so it can, it, a little bit uh, open-ended, but it has to have some specifics as well. And it should address possible common scenarios that can happen, possible complications like, um, you know, surgery is over and the patient's not waking up or the patient is vomiting or the patient is, is, um, is not taking fluids. And it, so uh, some of those possible scenarios should be addressed. And again, the, the, the technical stuff, it has to end with a physician's name. 
it has to end with a signature, a contact number, and a date. And it should be on letterhead paper. That if it's if that kind of presentation isn't there, um, the, the protocol won't get read on a technicality. So be prepared. Oh yes, and again, because you're dealing with physicians, and some of those physicians have egos. Um, everything should be diplomatic. So um, everything said, you, you can be assertive, but you but you should not be aggressive, and the protocol should be the same. Okay, so we're gonna talk about emergency protocols and the objective of an, the objectives of an emergency protocol is to um, provide um, essential information, key information um, in order to teach, to teach around the issue, not everything, but teach around the issue to direct um, care and if necessary to scare and it don't, don't it should, there shouldn't be, um, um, it shouldn't be filled with frightening things. Otherwise, again, you'll overwhelm and you'll, you'll push the doctor away. But um, it should put enough in there um, that they'll take notice. And then, um, and then, of course, there should be contacts. So the content, so the contents should have, it should, in my opinion, um, provide some general information about the disease as a whole, some background information, specific information about the patient, so the phenotype of the patient, um, the problem that we're focusing on. So if you're sending in, um, so for a mitochondrial patient who has potentially so many issues, you can't have a 17 page protocol that is um, you know, for heart concerns for vomiting concerns, for surgical issues, for anesthetic concerns. I mean, uh, it's, it's a little bit over, I wouldn't do that. That's where you get into, someone hands you a 17 page protocol and I would be afraid the doctor would glaze over and then you lose them. So I would, at the risk of have, have, um, being repetitious, have different protocols for different purposes. So if, if uh, a patient um, goes into the hospital because there's a regular vomiting issue, have a vomiting protocol. If there's a uh, patient's gonna have surgery, there should be a separate surgical protocol rather than, um, again, a, a 17 page one with, with different sections. Um, so the problem, if it's vomiting, um, yes, we can talk about vomiting, but it's useful to explain a, a little, the protocol should explain some of the physiology behind the vomiting, why the vomiting happens because um, if there's some understanding physiologically of why it happens, then um, um, the doctor feels he or she can participate because she understands what the underlying uh, physiology is. Of course, how to assess and then um, considerations of how to treat the problems. And the best protocols are patient and problem specific. So that's what I mentioned. It should be uh, specific for the patient um, based on the patient's uh, history and phenotype, and um, it should be problem specific. Again, not everything that can go wrong with that patient. So um, we're going to go through some, you know, details. So in a protocol, this is this is um, really with a focus on vomiting. So it needs to be dated, and it should be dated within the last year. Um, the name. So there are protocols that exist on the internet, which is um, approach to mitochondrial disease for blank. Um, you can't give that if it's not if it if it's not specific for the patient, uh, it's if it's not updated, if it's not signed by a doctor. Again, um, some may look at it, um, but it will often get discarded. So um, it has to be specific for the patient. And um, oops, sorry. And then. Um, some information about the patient. If um, the specific type of mitochondrial disease is known, it's useful to, uh, to put it in. Um, and then uh, what I usually begin with is <clears throat> um, um, a description of the patient's overall phenotype, um, probably listing the more common, uh, more important symptoms um, that the patient has or uh, medical problems and then the more rare ones towards the end. But it's an overall, um, just a general picture of the patient's mitochondrial disease. And so, and then um, some teaching, basic teaching about mito, 
and, and basically this is all I put in. And I'll read it with you. Mitochondrial disorders may involve any combination of a variety of body systems, including the brain and muscles, causing poor stamina, seizures, altered muscle tone, muscle weakness, strokes, autonomic nervous system uh, problems, so temperature dysregulation, heart rate abnormalities, blood pressure dysregulation, poor heat, tol intol uh, heat tolerance, increased sweating, skin pallor blotching, vision loss, hearing deficit, endocrine hormonal problems, so diabetes, hypothyroid, hypoparathyroid, adrenal problems, heart, cardiomyopathy, liver, kidneys, and so on. Um, so this is, this is intense and, um, but it's a, it, it's sort of a background. Um, it doesn't go on forever. I know this carries a risk, but it's only a paragraph. Um, so, you know, I leave that in there. Then with a general information behind us, then as teaching about the symptoms. So again, the symptom is vomiting. So vomiting is a common uh, symptom in patients with mito when the gut is affected by the disorder. The impact can result in uncoordinated movement or dysmotility of the gut. Regions of the gut can be affected to different degrees. So it can result in problems that include any of the following, swallowing, incoordination, gagging or choking, GE reflux, vomiting, delayed gastric emptying, bloating, abdominal pain, constipation, or incomplete um, um, stooling or evacuation. So it, it, it sort of gives you, it gives, it explains the physiology of uh, the vomiting problem behind mito. Infectious illnesses, surgical manipulation or disruption of the GI tract and anesthesia can reduce motility further, although usually transiently. The most common causes of slow motility are viral illnesses and vomiting likely occurs in part because during those viral illnesses, you have more GE reflux and you have de um, more delayed gastric emptying. In everybody, not just uh, mito patients, um, viruses slow down gastric emptying, which is why when we get sick, we lose our appetite because things just sit in our gut. And the last thing we want to eat are fatty foods because fat also slows down the gut. So um, that's why we lose our appetite. And if we do eat, we tend to eat things that are sugary, um, sort of easier. And then the last line, dehydration can also occur from a prolonged period of um, suboptimal fluid intake, even without vomiting. So again, um, this explains some of the physiology and how it will appear, might appear in the patient. And then for those patients who also have autonomic problems, that can also uh, play a role here. So patients with autonomic dysregulation are also at risk for vascular dysautonomia, where you get orthostatic changes, problems with your blood pressure and heart rate. Inadequate intake of fluids can result in dizziness, lightheadedness, uh, syncope, which is fainting, and significant fatigue, and can cause chronic nausea and vomiting. So um, again, it's, it's kind of specific vomiting-oriented information which the doctor needs to know. So what to do? So um, here is a list, uh, you know, what they should check with. And this is uh, because mitochondrial disease is um, multisystemic, you have to sort of keep an eye on everything. So a general assessment of mental status, check the heart and lungs. I mean, and these are things that uh, ER and ED doc will do anyway, but I mean, you really wanna kind of point it out. It's important to assess the hydration status if the issue is vomiting. Um, assess the heart rate, blood pressure, look for orthostatic changes, heart rate and blood pressure. Look for fever, infection, what, was, what might have triggered this um, uh, visit to the ER. Um, assess for changes uh, compared to usual state or symptoms. So, um, and this is where, you know, parents come in that my, ch you know, my child is always um, hypotonic, but today she's really hypotonic. So that ch anything changing from the norm um, should be, you know, uh, discussed. And if the symptoms are more severe, have them are changes or are there new symptoms that come out when a patient is sick, um, even if they're not there all the time. And then assess for acute biochemical problems like depending on um, the disease and the patient's history, electrolytes, low blood sugar, um, an acidosis, high ammonia, and so on. And then um, how to manage the patient. So, <clears throat> um, so this goes through a stepwise process. Um, 
So any patient who is vomiting or can take in adequate fluids by mouth or through their gut, an IV line is placed. Um, fluid should contain, and I keep a space there because depending on the mitochondrial disease, that might be 5% dextrose, say for a patient who has MELAS, might be 10% dextro, uh, dextrose for patients who, um, <clears throat> and actually I discussed that in point three, so I'll leave that till then. And if a patient has um, a central line, they might actually be able to get more, 15% uh, or 20% dextrose. Um, it all depends on, on um, um, and the doctor would fill that in. Um, just a point, um, I used to have, and we all used to have, um, you know, should avoid, um, patients should avoid receiving lactated ringers. So lactated ringers is a regular um, IV solution that has lactate in it. And we used to think that, oh my God, mito patients have sometimes have elevated lactates. You don't, the last thing you want to give is uh, uh, give a patient um, fluid with lactate in it. But in fact, um, th that's wrong. That, that thinking is out of date because that thinking does not understand the physiology that lactate is actually utilized as an energy source by the body. That um, yes, it's true with mitochondrial disease, there is some degree of um, uh, production of more lactate than usual, but that lactate doesn't poison, it doesn't intoxicate. Lactate is actually used as an energy source by the brain itself. And uh, the brain can take lactate and convert it to energy. So lactate is not a problem. Um, um, it does not make the patient more acidotic uh, in any way. So that has really re been removed from the ER protocols in mito disease. Um, now, here's the situation where you do need a specific type of um, um, dextrose. So a subset of patients with mitochondrial disease also have difficulty breaking down fat to form ketones. That the process where uh, our bodies uh, break down stored fat during fasting periods, break down that fat and convert them to ketones and the ketones are utilized as an energy source, that whole process occurs in the mitochondrion. And sometimes when the mitochondrion is dysfunctional, that process is impaired. So you produce less fewer ketones and so um, in that kind of situation, <clears throat> you want to use a higher dextrose solution, 10%, and you want to run it at at least one and a quarter or one and a half times maintenance. And so that kind of, um, um, and in some of those situations, a patient can become hypoglycemic when that is a particular aspect of their uh, mito, mito disease. So, um, so that's why that's listed. And What's the end point? Like when, um, when, when do you stop? Well, the patient might require admission um, until she, is, uh, she or he is able to tolerate consistently fluids by mouth or um, through their stomach if they have a G-tube. So um, just to give an idea in the ER, how long, um, um, if the patient doesn't tolerate anything by mouth and usually they can, um, and they, or they keep vomiting, uh, you're not gonna, they're not gonna be able to send that patient home. And then um, I always provide um, reference material. So I have taught them something in the protocol. And if they want to know more, here's where to find some. And this is a really good um, kind of review article, Patient Care Standards. This is a multi-page um, tome, um, but um, it's for the person who wants more information. And it is uh, subdivided nicely. So um, uh, it's easy to find um, uh, what you're looking for. And then again, the technical stuff, um, uh, the, the doctor's name, whoever your doctor is, and how to reach them. Um, so that uh, doctors who don't understand metabolic or mitochondrial disease, their worst fear is being left alone uh, with a patient who has problems and they don't know what to do. So this provides them an out. We always encourage uh, physicians to call us um, if, they're, if, if we know they're seeing a patient. Um, so that they don't feel alone. So here's a, a different um, um, type of letter. This is not an ER letter, this is a GI surgery letter. So, um, so this patient might have a gut problem 
but, and they're going for um, surgery, which may slow down their gut even more. And so the anesthesiologist and the surgeon should be aware of that. So I'll, I'll read with you. Patients with mito disease can tolerate surgery and anesthesia um, but safely, but um, procedures that impact the gut at any level can potentially destabilize these patients. So, um, and, and, and it could be a bi, it could be a placement of a G tube or, uh, or a J tube. Uh, anything like that, even certain GI procedures can interfere with gut motility. Um, okay, second paragraph, mito is often associated with some degree of, of normal gut motility associated with un, uh, uncoordinated movements or dysmotility. Regions can be affected to different degrees. We actually read this before. Um, so it, it, it is, uh, applies to this case um, as well. In the post-op period, the oral intake of food and, and liquid diminishes. Um, these patients are at risk for becoming dehydrated. Why would they become dehydrated? It occur for several reasons. Either there's pain at the surgical site, let's say a patient had the tonsils out, or there's fatigue from the surgical procedure anesthesia, and mito patients get that, or there's worsening gut motility um, with increase in if you disturb gut motility and if things don't move through the stomach, well, the food and stuff have to go somewhere and it comes up as reflux um, or delayed gastric emptying or a frank vomiting. So um, the, the anesthesiologist, the surgeon needs to be aware of that. Um, and if the patient does have disturbed gut motility, then, ref then the last sentence, refusal to eat or drink and poor calorie intake can worsen the fatigue and result in a prolonged recovery and occasionally readmission. So again, it's, it's um, um, because this is GI surgery, these are the bits of information that, that they need, that the uh, people involved need to know. So what to consider? Well, um, a pre-op appointment with anesthesia should be scheduled in advance of the surgical date, not on the same day, because um, if you're a complicated patient and the anesthesiologist is only seeing you an hour before the surgery, there's no time to do the research. Um, and you want the team um, to have adequate time to look back if there's a history of your getting, having had surgery, what anesthesia was done at that, used at that time, was it safe, maybe they can use that again, and to make, uh, and, to make and they need that time to prepare an, uh, an upcoming procedure. Um, the anesthesiologist may actually not know what to do and needs to do uh, his or her own research and, and call around. Um, Key elective procedures should be postponed if the patient develops any signs of infectious illness uh, around the time of the procedure date. Now, this is actually pretty common for any uh, surgery, whether you have mito or not. So, but it's just a reminder that for these patients, you, would, you wanna take no added risk. Uh, minimize the time necessary for fasting, especially some, um, some patients with mito can't tolerate fasting. Um, or, or very long fasting. So the patient should be encouraged to take some fluids uh, just before becoming NPO where they don't um, eat anymore. And then an IV line should be placed preoperatively and fluids provided until the patient is eating or drinking well. So, um, <clears throat> so if, um, if a patient is told, you know, be um, in pre-op at eight o'clock for nine o'clock surgery or for 9.30 surgery, then an IV should be started at eight o'clock or 8.30 because if the surgery gets postponed, you don't want the patient who's already been fasting to be fasting two hours, three hours, five hours, six hours, waiting um, for uh, a slot to open after the emergency case has been um, uh, done. So, so it's best just to keep IV uh, fluids going um, to keep the patient stable. And then here's more of the same types of IV fluids that we talked about um, with the other protocol, you know, but it applies here. And then special ifs. So if this patient demonstrates refusal to eat or drink after 24 hours post-op, uh, consideration should be given to providing, um, so this is 24 hours post-op, so the patient's already in hospital um, receiving fluids, uh, providing one to two days of total parental nutrition. In other words, um, if after 24 hours, a person doesn't want to uh, drink or eat, well, how are you going to get nutrition into them? If you go more than a day or two without nutrition, especially with mito, then you just get overly fatigued. Um, so 
Um, giving some added nutrition IV doesn't have to be, um, usually it doesn't have to be special nutri um, intravenous nutrition to standard type. Uh, it can um, reduce fatigue and related symptoms and shorten the stay in the hospital. If the patient takes any vitamins as part of her, uh, his or her mito management, these can be provided once PO and flus are tolerated. And if the patient um, has respiratory insufficiency because their trunk, their, uh, the muscles in their torso are, torso, uh, are weak, then um, what to do about um, helping regain lung function. Again, references to teach. Um, you know, there is a, a lot of concern about anesthesia in mitochondrial disease, but there's a lot of success. And most anesthetics can be actually used very safely. Uh, and they have been. Um, there's almost more worry about them than actual concerns, but there are certain things um, to know. And so these are out there. So again, the attributes of a good protocol, it assumes the reader is not familiar with the disease. You, you take it right to the, and that's why you include the physiology. You describe the patients particularly, you summarize the unique issues, you explain the issues clearly in understandable language, you break the issue into parts, pre-op, during, after, 24 hours after, you know, things to think about. So, and, and it should be in a sort of a logical, um, a logical sequence. Offer practical common sense advice. So don't say patients should have um, glucose. Well, you need, that's, yes, we should all have glucose, but you need to provide a sort of more specific information and address possible scenarios that can happen. If the patient doesn't eat or drink, um, if the, you know, if the patient's, uh, you want to prevent fatigue, um, if after 24 hours, you're still not um, uh, eating or drinking. So you want to address possible scenarios. And of course, the technical issues. So those are the things that I think about when preparing a protocol for, um, for the ER um, or for um, procedures or surgery within the hospital. So let's just um, take a, a look, um, a brief look at sick day protocols. Sick day protocols refer to those uh, protocols that are developed um, for use at home by the patient or by the family. What, what the objectives of developing these is to try to keep the patient stable and at home if possible. Um, and that way, um, if the patient is getting sick or showing uh, signs of concern, you can actually start uh, a treatment plan at home. And if it works, it's great. And if it doesn't, then the patient comes to the hospital, but something has already started at home to address the issue. This only works if, um, when you have a mito crisis or a metabolic crisis, if the crisis is not severe. Um, if a patient gets into trouble really quickly, I don't want that patient staying at home. They really have to come in. <clears throat> um, the crises have to be fairly known and predictable. So um, I would never make a diagnosis in a patient and, and, and I don't know that patient and I give them a protocol. I have to, I have to um, um, become familiar with the patient's crises. When the patient gets sick at home, what happens to her? Um, you know, how quickly do things progress? And of course, illnesses and crises may change from, uh, 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 from time to time, but you, you have to have a sense of what happens. Um, and only when I have a good idea of what happens do I feel safe, given uh, everything else, given reliable parents, given that they're good communicators and so on, uh, will I consider giving a protocol? And then the patient and parents. Um, <clears throat> you have to, I have to be convinced that the patient or parents know how to assess the patient's status, um, that I'm convinced that they understand the protocol the benefits and the limitations, when, when to ask for help, and that they're good communicators and reliable. If I don't get a good sense of these three, um, I won't provide a protocol. So, so this is a, a protocol actually for a, a fatty acid oxidation defect, <clears throat> which actually technically is a type of mito because uh, it's a defect in fatty acid oxidation, therefore is within the mitochondria, but um, it's not, it's, it's, it belongs to a different group of disorders, but that's the point being here. I'm just showing you the structure of it again. Um, so this is a protocol for parents or for patients. Um, <clears throat> so you don't have to explain the disorder. The disorder is already known to them. Um, 
it's important. Uh, I actually put this a couple of times in protocols, the, the numbers of who to call. Um, and um, so I, let me just read the last two. You know your child better than anyone else. You know his or her typical routine and when she, he or she may be out of sorts. It is important that you pay close attention when she's not acting normally and convey these concerns to the team. You and the clinic staff function together as a team to best assess your child and determine a plan that is right for his or her well-being. Why is all this said? <clears throat> it's sort of common sense. And you are the most sensitive uh, to know about yourself or your child. Um, with the protocol, the, the, the problems of the protocol, sending people home with protocols is that sometimes patients or parents get very familiar, very comfortable um, with managing and they stop calling the clinic. And then uh, maybe sometimes everything works out fine, but some, sometimes it doesn't. And then you're calling the clinic after a problem has been allowed to advance or progress beyond uh, where it should at home. So again, specific, these are questions that should be specific for a case based on how that child behaves. Again, I have to get to know how, what a child is like um, at home during when they get sick. So I know myself, what do I ask um, if the parent is calling me and what should parents look for? So these are very specific um, sort of patient uh, oriented questions. And then, and then uh, a list of a, a treatment plan, things that parents or patients can do at home, but again, should only be implemented um, after the case has been discussed with the team. And then uh, if there are any questions about the patient or the protocol, those are the numbers. Um, and again, uh, only um, don't implement the protocol um, unless you have a plan. That way, if you're, even if it's a quick call to the clinic, <clears throat> the clinic now knows they have to have on their radar, Joey at home, and either they're going to expect a call from the parent the next day, or they may have to call the parent depending on what the issues are. So um, you want uh, your, you or your child to be on their radar. Okay, oops. And then again, date and name. So again, the problems with home protocols, protocols are not kept up to date. So the last protocol um, that I wrote for Joey was five years ago, but Joey, you know, Joey doesn't stay the same and the disease actually doesn't change the same. And, and um, for, the, uh, for those of you who have been in this for a long time, you know that the symptoms you had when you presented are not necessarily the symptoms you have years later. Symptoms change, some become worse, some became, become less of an issue. Uh, the approach uh, might change. So protocols need to be kept up to date. And then patients or parents implement the protocol uh, uh, um, or, or make changes without calling the team. Um, and that's, again, what I mentioned before. Uh, then the treatment team becomes, uh, becomes uncoordinated that uh, you're doing something at home that the, uh, the hospital team doesn't know about. And, and then it's, again, it's not coordinated. And if the patient gets worse, the team doesn't know what's going on. So um, you want to avoid that. So, so that's it. Um, oops, sorry. <laughs> so that's it um, um, for the orient. I mean, there's lots more to talk about uh, in, in, in the ED experience or the home experience, but this is really just focusing on protocols and the things to think about uh, in a protocol, but actually in general treatment as well. So I'll take questions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Corson. Um, if you're on, just a reminder, if you're on your computer, if you have questions, you can submit them using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. And if you're on your phone, you can email those questions directly to us at info at mitoaction.org. Um, so one of the questions that came in, Dr. Corson, is what would be your recommendation in terms of a time frame to have your protocol letters updated? Like, should it be annually or, you know, when a child goes from pediatrics to adult, like, or are there turning points that, that require it to be updated? What's your recommendation for the frequency? If um, in general, um, I, I try to keep them within a year. Um, sometimes the protocol itself doesn't have to change at all, except um, to redate it. And, and that's fine. 
but it should probably it's it's beyond a year you run a risk that people won't look at it um certainly um when moving from pediatrics to adult medicine um the philosophy of medicine in pediatrics and the philosophy of medicine internal medicine is different and uh, the protocol should reflect it pediatric in pediatrics um the treatment team um, is much more active in supporting the patient and the family. Internal medicine is really the, the, the uh, philosophy there is that the patient should remain as independent as possible. Um, that can often, you know, pediatrics and, and internal medicine can often um, butt heads on that. So the, the protocol might need changing um, and, but the internist will will help with that so wonderful thank you for that recommendation so we have a question from a parent who has a child at college and she indicates that um, his home specialist has been reluctant to get involved when he's been hospitalized at school what do you recommend to help advocate for patients who are out of state or a child transitioning in a situation like that, right? A lot of kids who are at college, it's the first time they're on their own, having to advocate for themselves when they have a situation where they may have to go to a hospital alone without a parent there. Um, that's scary um, because again, um, um, when kids are young, let's say um, um, you know during earlier childhood, um, the kids don't. Um, the kid's not the, the kid is not the one who's doing the advocacy. The parents do the advocacy because that's appropriate. Mito is complex and, and kids just you know don't do that. Um, what in preparation for college, um, actually let me back up a bit. Uh, we learned from the diabetic population that Children with diabetes during their early years, and of course, diabetes is a very significant illness. Um, I mean, you have to control blood sugars, but you have to control insulin. You don't want the, too much insulin, and those could be life-threatening crises. So the parents completely dominate their child's care. All right, that's perfect. That's appropriate. Well, they keep doing it at age nine, age eleven, and age thirteen, and then you have diabetic adolescents who have no idea, who don't feel that. Uh, the diabetes is their own disease. It's their parents' disease because they have, they're not invested in it. Right. And suddenly kids who are perfectly well-controlled in child, who are perfectly well-controlled in childhood end up in the ICU with diabetic ketoacidosis or hypoglycemia or inappropriate because uh, one never shifted the responsibility for care from patient, from parent to child. So, um, so the transition of responsibility for one's illness really needs to start um, during childhood, late childhood, right. and through early adolescence. So you slowly transfer um, responsibility and knowledge about the disease so that the child is less likely um, to um, resist or withdraw. They feel like the disease is their own. That is excellent preparation for advocacy knowing about themselves and advocating at college. If the child never has had to do that and they go to college, you're in for, you're in for trouble. So um, that's preparation for college. Um, the the uh, protocol should go with that um, uh, teenager and the it should be reviewed in detail with the teenager so the teenager knows exactly what's in the protocol, why it's that way, um, because you need that knowledge to advocate. And um, I'm not, so if, if the protocol has been written and it's been written by the doctor at home, I'm not exactly sure why, why the doctor can't be a, um, a reference, a call. Um, they may not know the particular situation that landed the patient, but um, the, the, the home doctor can uh, I just, it doesn't make a difference to me in Boston whether the child is or the teenager is admitted 40 miles away or 400 miles away. It's, it's, I would still take the call. So um, I would just make sure that patient can advocate well for himself or herself. Yeah. And perhaps another suggestion is that 
before there's a crisis event that perhaps you can schedule a time to get the local doctor who's the new doctor at college and the doctor from home together to have a conversation prior to an event like that happening. Absolutely. So, so yes. So, um, so I was sort of considering, um, you know, going to an ED in a city near the college, but you're absolutely right. I mean, um, um, the doctor who works in the health clinic on campus that should, uh, could also serve as a local reference point uh, to help advocate for the uh, uh, student. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a tough time. It's a tough time giving, giving the kids that freedom. Um, it's tough. So um, yes. it's a good question. Um, so what are your recommendations when you go to the hospital, you have an updated protocol letter, and the ED is not willing to follow the recommendations, especially when you know that perhaps the decisions they're making could be really detrimental to your loved one who's receiving right. Well, that's where weapons of mass destruction come in handy. <laughs> so, um, no, um, um, that's when, and, and that's actually a relatively common scenario where um, they just don't want to participate in, in your care properly and, um, and they're not following the protocol. That's when I say, hey, um, can you call my doctor? Actually, they could really, he, he could really help you out. And here's the number. And if they don't call, then you call your doctor and say, listen, Dr. Jones here, yeah, you know, we're here, you, uh, you know, you know, we're here and Dr. Jones won't read the protocol and won't, um, is not doing anything. Um, if I got that call, I know I need to call Dr. Jones. Yeah. Um, I just need the name and I need the, you know, and I can uh, get, need the number and I'll talk to Jones and, and I'll call Dr. Jones and I can then um, um, list the kind of things that need to be done. And um, that responsibility, if the doctor won't listen to you, you um, you're, there's nothing, not much you can do except to get um, reinforcements. And that's where we come in. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, though, there are so many physicians who aren't as generous with their time as you are, um, who are willing to get on the phone. And that creates a really difficult situation for some of our families. So at least having those letters and knowing what they need to be armed with going into a situation like that can help as well. Okay, but, but, but that's it. Okay, but, and that I understand that and people are very, very busy and I, I understand that. But um, I guess what you have to do is um, don't um, bear responsibility for a situation that's beyond your control by yourself. Right. So the next visit to clinic or in advance, tell your doctor what you need from them. And that this is our scenario. What pose the situation to them? What do we do? We're in an ER. They're not looking at the protocol. They're not listening. You tell me what we should do. Right. And so if they tell whatever they tell you, um, at least they've said it and they'll, they'll almost certainly stand behind what they say if posed with a problem. So drop the problem in their lap and see what they say. Right. Cause they're not going to, they're not going to encourage you to exacerbate the issue. They're going to help. Yes, right. Absolutely. Right. Next question is if I have a protocol letter that, that you know is not sufficient, how do you broach this topic with your doctor without putting them on the defense? So, um, Well, um, that's, well, that's where, okay. So <clears throat> let's talk about diplomacy <laughs> because it's all about diplomacy. It's how to be assertive without being aggressive, how to get you, how, um, don't, okay. It's how to communicate well. So uh, again, be assertive without being aggressive, without being abusive, without, accus without ac accusing. Um, it's like what therapists tell you to do. If, you, if something's on your mind, if you start accusing and putting someone on the defensive, then the, then the dialogue is shut down. Right. What you should do is just talk about your feelings, right? If you just talk about your feelings, then the other person is more likely to be compassionate and, and actually talk to you about it. So if you're looking at a protocol, talk about what your fears are. That, um, you know, um, 
this is out of date and I'm afraid they're not going to. Um, you know, um, Joey has so much, so many problems with vomiting and, and there's nothing here about vomiting. And I, you know, it's, and talk about your fears. And I think that's a better way of approaching it than saying this is no good because it's missing this, it's missing this. Talk about your fears. Yes. So let's, I'm just going to share quickly before we sign off a good story about a protocol letter that went well. And the note says, thank you to Dr. Corson. I just used a fever protocol with my primary care physician in DC in January, 2022. I had COVID and fever for 14 days. I got IV fluids with dextro, dext, dextrose when I really needed it. It went so smoothly. Oh, it doesn't always have to be contentious. <laughs> that, that's right. That's right. It, in most cases, protocols work. And of course, this lecture focuses on the, you know, what doesn't work. So yes, most of the time it does work. Right? Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Corson. We are so grateful for your ongoing commitment to help educate the medical community so that more physicians understand and can help our families affected by not only mitochondrial disease, but other rare diseases as well. And, and also arming our families with the tools that they need to be their best advocates. So we truly appreciate all that you do and for taking time out of your really busy schedule to be here with us and share this information today. Absolutely. So you can also find samples of protocol letters on the MitoAction website, but we also want to remind you that you need to have your doctor customize these letters specific for your needs, but it's a good tool to give you a place to start. So as a reminder, today's presentation will be posted on our website for anyone who would like to listen again, share with others, or go back at a later date and listen. We thank each and every one of you for joining us today for our monthly expert series. Have a wonderful weekend. We look forward to staying in touch. Until next time. Thank you so much, Dr. Corson. Bye-bye. Be well. Take care.